I'm here with Mark Honeyman. Mark, thank you for inviting me to your driveway. <laughs> My pleasure having you here. And this is really cool for me because we reconnected for the first time probably after like 13, 14 years, just a few months back. Yep. Um, so it's really cool to be uh, diving into conversation uh, with you from a complete different life standpoint. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it very much. Um, so let's start off very, very broad, and then we'll go very, uh, very nuanced. Uh, what's on your mind in this moment? <laughs> oh, goodness, boy. Right now, uh, what's on my mind is the business that I'm trying to get started. Uh, I'm working on a a project that is designed to help high school juniors primarily, that's our sort of our focal point or our target audience, uh, figure out who they are and how to how to sort of tap into the resources that are out there to figure out what kind of career might be the most fulfilling choice for them. Uh, and so that has just been consuming every waking moment for, of my life for about the last, well, I've been, I've been working on it earnestly since about November, but really it's been in the last month and a half to two months once the pilot program with a group of high school kids who were helping us test it out got started. Uh, that it just, that's, that's kind of my daily routine. Get up, start thinking about it, working on paperwork and graphic design items and all kinds of things. So it's, it's really exciting. It doesn't. And well, I think I'd love to dive into the, the kind of content of that business a little later on in the sure. conversation, if it takes us there, it doesn't surprise me that that's the realm that you'd now be finding yourself in. Um, you were my, what would the subject, were you, were you my language arts teacher, my English teacher? What was the, yeah, what so, was the discipline well, name? did I have you as an eighth grader or a seventh grader? I want to say seventh grader. Was Mr. Baylog uh, a team teacher with me at that time? I w want to say yes, but my episodic memory is so poor. Gotcha. So anyway, if if it, my suspicion is I had you as a seventh grader, which means that I would have taught you English and history. Okay. Uh, and if not, it would have been just language arts. I think so. it was just language arts. Okay. So then I'm, you might have caught me right on the cusp of when I moved up from seventh to eighth grade. Uh, once I got into eighth grade, they asked me to do just language arts solely. So... Okay, so the context in which I knew you, I believe, my episodic memory is telling me just language arts, but truth is truth, and sometimes my interpretation of it is, is inaccurate, but I believe it's accurate. Um, but nonetheless, I digress. Um, it doesn't surprise me that you'd be in this realm because it always struck me um, the seriousness of which you took the relationships with your students as also being of importance when juxtaposed with the information you were actually conveying or, or yeah. quote there to, to convey. Right. For you as an educator, to what extent did you see um, your role as a relationship builder and a human molder as opposed to a purveyor of knowledge? Mm. So, so for me, when I first started thinking about teaching as a career, uh, I, I can remember being in a class where we had to write an essay about how we were going to approach our relationship with our students. And, and I, I remember it was just this very stiff, pedantic, you know, I'm going to have to maintain a very deep professional distance. There's a certain amount of, you know, rigor and, and you know, it, and it, it just, it was... It, and and then I started te actually teaching. Like I actually got into a classroom and immediately kind of threw that whole perspective out the window because I realized I was in the presence of these beautiful souls who were vulnerable and wanting to learn and grow and connect with each other and connect with me and see me as an ally. And, and I couldn't keep that sort of um, stern affect and allow that to grow. And so, I mean, literally within, you know, a week of really? me starting my student teaching, let alone my actual wow. official teaching, I already knew that my preconceptions of my role and my, you know, just sort of the way I would carry myself had already radically altered in a really profound, beautiful way. Uh, and so it, it really became, well, and I, I even had a student say to me one time, you know, Mr. Honeyman, in your class, I learned as much about life as I did about English. And I don't know if I've been given a greater compliment than that, uh, because that's what I wanted. I wanted them to be immersing themselves, not just in whether they could write a compound complex sentence or understood how to analyze To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> but that they saw themselves as change agents in the world around them and that they saw themselves as having unique skills and, and unique talents that could make a difference, that could literally go out and change the world. And so, so when, they, when they started looking at the world through a broader lens than just some dry academic exercise, 
that that was an exhilarating moment for me where I thought, wow, you know, there, my what was already a pretty passionate mission about getting language arts across to them and the power of language now became exponentially broader in in ways that I could have never anticipated. Yeah, that that's beautiful. And one thing struck me that you said, and I'd be curious to see if you if you can and wish to articulate on it. You said you <clears throat> you noticed that each of them had like a unique soul or a unique skill set. When you use that word soul or when you use that word spirit, what was in that first week where you had that big shift? Was there something reflected back at you from the students' eyes or, or from their beings that said to you, oh, there's something more here than just the knowledge? What, when you use the word soul or spirit in the context of the student, mm. what, is, it, is it not able to be articulated because it's so ineffable? Or is there something there that that word means to you? Yeah, no, it's, it's very present. As a matter of fact, as you were wording your question, I was already starting to get choked up thinking about how I would respond to that. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the dominant feeling I had when I walked into a group of kids was fear. Not mine, theirs. Uh. That, that incredible sense of, am I worth anything? Does anybody notice me? If I speak, will it be honored? Uh, do I have something special to offer the world? Uh, just this incredible, it, the, the comparison, there was a movie that came out many years ago, but I, I can remember this one time, this student of mine, this cemented it in my mind where I asked the kids to learn some scenes uh, or some lines from the uh, Romeo and Juliet, the balcony scene. And this one, the first student to go said, you know, can I, can I go in the hall for a minute? And I'm yeah, all right. And I'm a new teacher. I'm thinking, don't do anything too weird, right? You know, I don't have tenure. This is scary. Uh, and so, and he says, oh, and can we close the blinds? and turn off all the lights. I'm like, oh, okay, oh, what have I got myself into, right? So we did all that. He walks out into the hallway. Next thing I know, he comes flying back into the room, but soft with light through yonder window breaks, and his friend flings the curtains open. Sunlight streams into the room. It was breathtaking. And he's dressed in full Shakespearean regalia. All I had said, memorize 20 lines from the balcony scene, same from memory, I'll give you the A. Here's this 14, 15 year old football mm. player with the ruffled shirt and the mm. tights and the little hat with the feather sticking out, and he's reciting Shakespeare, and so I'm I'm in hysterics already. And then you know it is my lady, it is my love, and he's, his friend's holding a Cabbage Patch kid up in the back of the room that he's reciting the rest of the scene to, and and so I'm frantically you know scrambling to write all these notes down and you know congratulating him for being a risk taker and how proud of him, and I looked up, and every child in that room was looking at me. Not at him. Is it okay? Can, can, mm. we, can we take a risk? Can you let your true spirit shine and, and not have it squashed because it didn't fit the rubric or it didn't fit the... And, and I'll never forget that. And so the, the phrase that keeps coming to my mind is the title from the movie from a number of years ago, Waiting to Exhale. Mm. Where I had 30 kids in that room waiting to exhale. And so the power of that moment and the enormous weight that beautiful, enormous weight of responsibility that I had to make sure that every particle of how I interacted with those kids let them know that they were valued and they were safe and that they would be championed and that even in their darkest moments, I would still love them. Maybe especially in their darkest moments, I would still love them. What did you notice when you began this shift after perhaps a week and over the course of your over the course of your career and your time with these students what did you notice psychologically or spiritually i mean mm -hmm. and, and you know let's just say what happened what was reflected back at you from their being when you would notice their fear and then over time you began to accept them for who they were yeah. did you notice anything happen um as a whole to your classroom or to individual students either positive or negative as a result Oh, it was overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly positive, and it didn't take long. Uh, what happened was there was this incredible sort of sense of walls tumbling and, and kids' true spirits blossoming where they weren't waiting for the other shoe to drop. They, they invested wholeheartedly, uh, and, and, and it brought out such joy 
and such freedom and such openness. And, and I cherished it. And so we, we literally, every single class I taught, every hour, you know, if I was teaching, you know, a certain group of kids a second hour every day for a year or whatever, we became a family. Mm. And every hour had its own sort of personality and mm. quirks. And, but, but the, you know, the kids felt safe and, and they knew that I would stand up for them if something happened where they started to feel vulnerable. Uh, and even beyond the walls of the classroom, you know, I mean, I, I had kids call me at three in the morning twice who were suicidal. Uh, I had kids who would email me at 12 and 12 midnight saying, honey, man, I'm having trouble, you know, getting along with my parents or, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with whatever it was, you know. And so it, it's funny, I, it, my colleagues, when I would show up in the teacher's lounge for lunch, they would mock me because I would walk in the door and they'd be like, uh, you look vaguely familiar. We haven't seen you in about three because I'd be with students every single lunch period talking to them about whether it's a piece of curriculum they were struggling with or a personal problem or whatever it was. And, and so there was just this wellspring of, of intimacy and beauty that came out of that, that, that again was unanticipated, but from the minute I saw it starting to burgeon, I thought I want to try to recreate this every single group that walks into my room. To what extent were you blessed and thrilled by that responsibility and to what extent were you fearful of that responsibility <laughs> wow that's that's a profound question um i have to be honest with you i had many people who told me over my career adults who said mark you trust too much oh you you take too many risks oh you're going to get burned all oh, the kids are going to let you down oh you know there there were plenty of naysayers of my approach i uh, and and i don't think I don't think they had ill will necessarily, sure. but, you know, it just, I, I wasn't running around with a pack of folks, you know, sort of saying, way to go, buddy, you know, keep it up. Um, hmm. And, but, but that wasn't why I was doing it. That wasn't my mission. My mission wasn't to win over anybody over the age of 18, other than maybe parents who I wanted them to feel that we were in this, you know, in this together. I, I, I was looking to win over a group of young people who I knew had this sort of crushing vulnerability in their lives and were just waiting to, to be able to breathe again and to feel like they could go to the edge of that branch and know there was somebody who was either going to be there with them on the branch or be waiting to catch them if the branch broke down below and to help them back up the tree again. Yeah, that's beautiful. One thing I'm, I, I think it came up briefly last time we spoke, but I'm curious to expand on it more because I've been thinking about it mm. a lot, mm. um, is, you know, sometimes being supportive uh, to a child or to an individual could be letting them know when they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it could be opening up and letting them know the beauty within. Yeah. Um, to what extent when, especially in seventh and eighth grade, I can attest to <laughs> watching my class, um, there's a bit of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's rebellion against uh, authority. Maybe it's rebellion against existence itself. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is when we can talk about that. But to what was your model of dealing with such rebellious behavior? How did you know when to go more of a potentially, like, like punitive restricting route and how did you know when to just simply be an ear and yeah. see the rebellion as just a cry for an ear? Yeah. Um, what was your approach when, when, when there was behavior that wasn't really uh, permitted in the classroom per se? Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, I, I have to tell you, I probably wouldn't need more than a single hand to count the number of times that I had to take a significant disciplinary step with a child, either at the high school or at the middle school. Um, you know, yeah, there were a couple times where I had to send kids to the office or a couple times where there were, you know, some pretty intractable issues going on. But even then, I, I recognized that it wasn't, and especially as time passed, like in the early part of my career, I think I struggled more with that, uh, you know, that sense of needing to be the disciplinarian, yeah. you know. Uh, and and what, I, what I began to realize is that so many, almost exclusively, but so many of those behaviors were because of pain. Yep. And so it, it wasn't personal and it wasn't even intentional. And so it, when, I, when, when I was able to step back and take my ego out of it and realize 
they were just going through stuff, you know, just natural stuff for a person their age who's trying to figure out who they are and how they fit into the world and how can I kind of develop my own sense of personhood beyond what society is trying to force me to become mm-hmm. or tell me I'm allowed to do uh, and, to, and to leave room for that. And so I, I, I but, but again, it, there weren't that many of those moments. And, and I think 99.9% of that is because of the relationship. If the relationship wasn't there, it changes the tone of the room. Mm-hmm. And so when the kids know that they've got an adult in their life who's utterly devoted, utterly there for them, who loves them no matter what, it, it changes how they want to behave for that person. I can't tell you the number of kids who, you know, you'd hear through the grapevine, oh man, that kid's, you know, hell on wheels, man, that kid's, you're going to watch out, he's going to be a behavior. Almost to a child, those kids ended up being heroes, heroes, gold standard kids for behavior. Like I, I would say to people, we'd be having meetings. I'm going, man, uh, I, it, it you know, you'd almost have to feel guilty, right? Because everybody's kind of waiting for, yeah, feel me too, that man. You know, boy, that kid, there. you know. Yeah. Uh, and I and I couldn't do it. I, I'd be like, yeah, he's great for me. Uh, you know, she's doing awesome. You know, and so and so that relationship. And I and I've had students say to me, Mister Honeyman, all you'd have to do is give us the look, and not and not the angry look that like disappointed in us, like we'd hurt you and, you know, we hadn't lived up to our best selves and mm. it was just, you know, and I never wanted to see that look like I didn't want to let you down. I, I valued our relationship so much that I didn't want to hurt you or make you feel that I had dis- disrespected you or the class or what you were trying to teach us. Um, and so it, it circumvented that relationship, mm. circumvented so many of the issues that I saw crop up. Yeah. From per- and from personal experience and from what you're what I'm hearing and seeing in you, you valued kind of allowing them to express their deepest vulnerabilities and to be heard potentially for the first time. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I was always struck by in the classroom, but I'd be curious to hear, you know, the intention behind it and how you did it maybe even beyond when I was in the classroom. It sounds like the the language arts, the English, the 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 structure, the quote reason that they were there was a mechanism and a gathering place for you to really do some of this high work. Yeah. Um, to what extent did you actually use the vehicle of the language arts, like assignments per se, mm. to to facilitate a goal of self-expression within yeah. the assignment? Yep. That's a phenomenal question. So just, I'll give you a couple examples. One with vocab, uh, and vocabulary was the cornerstone of my class, whether it was when I was teaching ninth grade and 10th grade high school English, or whether it was seventh and eighth grade middle school English, it always centered around the vocabulary because words have such power to change the world, to make a difference in people's lives. And I, I wanted, the, the metaphor I used to use with my students is that I wanted them to see themselves, I, I wanted to help them gain a palette of shades so that when they went to use language, they had this incredible array of colors and nuances that would allow them to be word artists. Mm. And so, so, and so, when they wrote their sentences, yes, there were very, very specific, very intense, very high expectations academically. They had to be compound complex. They had to have a lot of imagery. They couldn't use passive verbs. So there were all those kinds of things. But beyond that, I encourage the kids to write sentences that either made them laugh or express some some social issue that they were ticked off about or whatever it might happen to be. So so they, instead of it being this, again, this sort of dry, dusty set of sentences, okay, yep, check it off, yep, he did, had a compound come up. We would be cracking up at some of the sentences. That, and sometimes they would be so enthusiastic. I mean, these kids would write a single sentence that would be half a page long and they'd be so into it, they would forget to vo- put the vocab word in it. Mm. Like mm. they'd get to the end. It, how cool is that? That's a, yeah. That they, they were so passionate about, you know, that, oh yeah, th- this is school. Wow, I'm having so much fun, you know. And so it became an adventure instead of, you know, a task. Um, and, so, and, and so that was an example. And then another example would be in my short story unit, in particular in eighth grade. I, I taught uh, usually between five to seven, maybe eight short stories throughout the unit. 
And at first, when I first started doing it, it was strictly, let's read it, we'll talk about the plot, we'll do some literary analysis, you'll take a test, done. As I got further into my, my middle school career, I started to center the entire unit around stereotypes. And every time they'd read a story, the first day's discussion, and I'd have a set of seven, eight, nine questions put up on the Promethean board or the chalkboard back in the old days, uh, all of which dealt with life issues. I said, and I would tell the students, I would say, I want us to talk about the real world. When you read literature and you bring your, your lens to it, that's important information for us. That's a beautiful perspective that nobody else on the planet can bring to it because nobody else has walked in your shoes. And so when we open up a story, I don't want to start talking about symbolism. I want to start talking about, so what did that teach us about people who have mental illnesses? Or what does mm. that teach us about the difference between socioeconomic status and what, what life experiences that could lead to and the opportunities that might deny somebody who doesn't have that? You know, uh, or what does that tell us about gender roles and how they, you know? And so it, it, it turned into these really profound conversations around they'd walk out my room and be facing those things in every other part of their daily life. And, and so now they were, facil you know, I was able to facilitate conversations and I would turn it over to the kids. It wasn't me pontificating or telling them how they ought to believe about all those things. I'd pose the question and then I'd shut up and let them have at it. And it was beautiful watching them take ownership over that. And, and so now it wasn't somebody preaching at them or telling them where to find the right answer because there wasn't one. Mm. So, and so it just became these really rich conversations about their lives and not just the curriculum. A very tangential question. At the very least, <laughs> I'm asking because I'm interested, um, <laughs> but I hope other people will be too. It sounds like not only did you allow space for the written word, but you allowed space for the spoken word. Mm -hmm. What parallels and differences do you see between communicating through written word and communicating through spoken word? And then how does that tie into which ones allow for self-expression in different ways? Mm, wow. So for me, the written word, I think, is more challenging. Be even though, even though people can revise and, you know, rewrite it and w get it exactly the way they want it, you don't hear the tone of voice. You don't see the facial expression. You don't see the posture. Uh, you don't. You can't ask them about their intent, and so there. There's a certain level of disconnect with the written word, even if it's incredibly carefully crafted, uh, and especially if it's in a, a tweet or a text or an email or you know where I watched my kids just thrashing around in agony over misperceptions and something where somebody said something, but they didn't really mean it that way, mm -hmm. but they took it that way because they didn't know the tone of voice, you know. And so, so to me, the written word was really challenging. Uh, the, the, but, but because of how crucial that is to the student's ability to write papers for teachers, to write job proposals or to communicate with, you know, a religious organization or to whatever, you know, whatever means they needed to communicate in writing, I wanted them to have an understanding of how powerful that could be if they had the tools and if they recognized how to craft things in ways that could be the most persuasive to their audience. Uh, in terms of the spoken word, it was, it was, a lot of it had to do with respecting each other. It wasn't even as much about, you know, I, I want to make sure I get my, you know, my two cents worth in. It was about listening and, mm. and you know, mm. and, and not just waiting for them to get done so you could leap on it, but really interacting what was, with what was being said and, and talking to people about, you know, the tone of voice and the body language and, you know, you're slumped in your desk with your hand on your face. You know, what is that telling, you know, people? And I wouldn't say it quite that way, but I'd say, you know, hey, let's, let's look at our body language right now. Some of you are communicating that, mm, you know, maybe you're not as interested in what this person's saying right now. So, uh, or, you know, a, a kid would get done with a speech and, you know, you'd get some kids who'd clap and some who wouldn't. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, that didn't happen often because I would leap on that and talk to them about, you know, you just had somebody stand up there mm. and make themselves unbelievably vulnerable to you. And this was all you could muster or, it, or you just sat there when they got done, you know, and yet you're sitting there trembling at the thought that you might be the next kid to speak. Come on. You know, let's let's give them the kind of support that you're hoping we're going to give you when you stand up there. Uh, and so 
you know, so really encouraging students when they used oral communication to recognize that once it's out of your mouth, you're not getting it back. So you need to be really cognizant of how you express yourself and really sensitive to what other people are saying. Uh, and so just the, the, again, it's just these incredible conversations that would arise from, and, it, and it's funny, and they would see me modeling that. And so, and it's funny, I, I, I cannot tell you how many times kids would say to me when I'd walk in the door and I'd say, yeah, you know, hey guys, I want you to clear everything off of your, your desks because, uh, I, I, you know, I want to talk to you. And I would have students, uh, are you going to make us cry again today? <laughs> because I, I would share these really intense personal stories uh, or, you know, something really um, dramatic trying to, you know, drum up the kid's passion about a, a, a fundraiser for a food bank or, a, you know, whatever. Uh, and I would use language to do that. And, and they knew if I said, oh, I want nothing on your desk to distract you. I want, you know, and all I ask is that you give me your whole selves for mm. the next couple of minutes. And then I would just make myself raw and vulnerable to them and, and express myself and, and to watch. And it's funny because in the beginning of the year in particular, I could see the discomfort in, in some of the kids when I would do that, understandably. Yeah. And as time passed, and especially, my God, by the end of the year, when we would have those kind of conversations, just the light in their eyes. And then instantly, like the last day of school, uh, I would always tell them that I loved them on their way out the door. You know, love you, love you, goodbye. You know, and they'd walk out and I'd tell them the next day and the next because I wanted them to hear that I love them every single day. And so at the end of the uh, school year, I would say, you know, and now for the last time, love you, goodbye. And we'd all cry and we'd hug. And, and there was just this incredible bond, this unshakable bond that had been built. And as you know, I shared with you in our, our coffee house meeting a couple months ago, I took a trip around the country to visit various former students. Mm. And every single stop I made, whether it was a person I had taught four or five years earlier or somebody I hadn't seen in 25 years, every single stop was something transformative because of what had been built 25 or 30 years ago, potentially. What really strikes me is you're, you know, you you appear to really be tapped into the human psychology and the human spirit, but you recognize, I think, this the the kind of infinite ceiling that at least I believe in, and it, it appears to me that you believe in that there's an infinite ceiling in terms of the human capacity for joy yes. and beauty and, and self-realization, but also the, the depths of despair that are possible and suffering yes. and pain yes. and fear that we've yeah. addressed as well. You mentioned how you would share your own personal stories and you would reflect what it looks like to be raw and vulnerable so that they could then have permission to right. reflect that back. Yes. To what extent did your own personal pain and suffering um, in your life uh, mm. impact your ability to understand humans' capacity for suffering and why we should transcend that. And are there specific mm -hmm. instances or experiences either over time or, or uh, kind of just singular experiences that, that you had that caused suffering or pain that you've learned from and now been able to understand humans' capacity for that kind of emotion? Right. So, I... I mean, there's, there's a number of things, but one of the things that comes to mind, I have a neurological condition called essential tremor. And it's basically a part of my brain shooting off electrical impulses that I can't control. It's going on all the time. And now, right now, you wouldn't even necessarily know, right? Uh, and I don't know how much of a close-up the cameras have on my head because uh, when I get emotional or, you know, an excess of any kind of an emotion, positive, negative, doesn't matter, sometimes my head will shake, um, mm. my hands and arms and trunk even. I'll, my voice will sometimes tremble if I'm really in an extreme version of it. Uh, and I first noticed it when I was in seventh grade and I had a teacher mock me for it. I gave a speech and my hands were shaking more than the average students. And I got done and he looked at me and he said, who, me, nervous? I was blown away. I was blown away. And so from that moment, that, that illness plagued me. But the problem was, I didn't know what the hell it was. I just thought I was weak. Mm. I just thought I couldn't handle the rigors of life. And so every time I was in a hurry or angry or sad or excited or, you know, any extremity, good or bad, my body would desert me. And I just pummeled myself for being, for having this moral defect mm. and this incapacity to handle 
the challenges that life threw at me on a daily basis. And it wasn't until I got into my early 30s where the head tremor started to kick in pretty high. And I thought, this is not, this can't be because I'm just a wimp. It's, there's got to be something going on here. Went to a neurologist and within five minutes they had diagnosed it. And I actually wept with relief that I knew what yeah. I was fighting. Yeah, right. And so here's, here's, this is a long way of getting to the answer to your question. Going through that experience, it humbled me. It made me appreciate what somebody who feels totally exposed, totally humiliated, totally vulnerable, um, incapable of handling what life throws at him or being, you know, looked at strangely by others. I was so much more attuned to that. I think there would have been a level of arrogance in me, mm. uh, or at least a level of, um, disdain or, or not, not appreciate, not, you know, a, a lack of appreciation of what people were going through if I hadn't had to walk that path. And so it sensitized me profoundly to what it means to feel vulnerable and, and to have something you can't control be a part of you. And so it, it, I think that was one of the, one of the core things that led me to become the teacher I became, uh, is that I knew my students were facing those kinds of things. And whether it was something about their nose or something about a relative or they were overweight or they had red hair or they were black or whatever it was that had put them as other. And really, aren't we all other, right? But we find so many ways to hate each other, so many ways to categorize worth instead of seeing the wholeness of human beings. And so going through that experience, I think made me a better human and made me a better teacher. Now let's go to the flip side of what can teach us, which is joy. So we just talked about pain and suffering and how there's beauty within that. I know this came a little bit later in your life mm -hmm. and I'm not going to give away too much and I want to hear it <clears throat> from the actual source, but it's, it's beautiful how such pain and suffering can be a teacher, but how joy can be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And it also teaches us that both exist. Yeah. Um, I know there was some immense surprise and joy in your life um, when you realized that your family structure was different than what you once presumed. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about the actual content of that surprise first. Absolutely. And then what it is like for you to experience such feeling of just like paralyzing joy. And, mm -hmm. and, and maybe I phrased that wrong, <laughs> but that's how I would have felt. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I was adopted at a very young age. Uh, I always knew it about myself. It was no big deal. Uh, I think I was a month old maybe. And so my parents told me so young, I don't even remember being told and nobody teased me. It was not a deal right? Never felt like I had to get back in touch with my roots or search out anything. But then when I started having the essential tremor and some other health things, I emailed the adoption agency and they sent me a little packet and said, you know, uh, your mom had to give you up for adoption. She was engaged to be married to your dad, but he was killed in a car accident just before you were born. She didn't have means of, you know, caring for you properly. And so, you know, and, and then there was a little bit of medical info, but not much, but then it was a closed adoption. So that was kind of the end of it, right? And so once my parents died, my adoptive parents died, because I didn't want to be doing any searching when they were still alive beyond the medical piece. Um, I didn't want them to feel like they hadn't been enough because they were, they were plenty. You know, they did everything they could to give me a beautiful life. And so, but once they passed, I thought, well, you know, what the heck, maybe mom's still out there and maybe she'd want to know the kind of life I've led and the gratitude I feel toward her for giving me life. And, you know, and so I started searching and I uh, submitted my DNA to uh, Ancestry and nothing much came back from that. And then I, in one of those wild domino moments, told a class of kids that I was doing this search. And this one girl said, oh, well, my mom works for a group, or she volunteers for the search squad on Facebook. And I'll tell her about you. I'm like, yeah, all right. I didn't think much of it. I, you know, I figured it'd be another dead end because yeah. of ancestry couldn't find it, you know. Uh, and so the next morning, the mom calls me and says, oh, yeah, I've got you hooked up with a search angel already. She's on your case. Never met the person before. Never for three years this person has worked on my behalf. 
No money, no acclaim, no letters of rec, no nothing, just to do that, to do the right thing, to help somebody. So anyway, she started searching. Finally, about a year and a half ago, actually close to two years now, holy cow, uh, she sends me a message and says, Mark, your birth mother lied. I said, what are you talking about? She said, your dad didn't die in 1960, he died in 2013. Like, what? <laughs> Turns out he had had an affair at a time when he was married and already had three kids, and I am the product of that affair. And I do not believe that he ever knew I existed because my mom had the affair with him in Omaha, Nebraska, but bore me in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so I think she fled the state, potentially to spare herself some of the embarrassment of an unwed mother with a you know child out of, you know, or maybe to spare him. Uh, and so, uh, because there's some evidence that she was deeply in love with him, um, because she named me, I've since discovered, after his firstborn son and my father. So I was named Scott James, and my dad's firstborn son was Scott, and my dad's name is James. This wasn't a one-night stand. This was, this was somebody she cared about deeply. Uh, and so, so now I have all this information at my disposal. I know about all my family members. I know, but how do I reach out to them? I, I'm living proof that... And their mom, by the way, not my mom, but my sibling's mom, of whom there are seven, <laughs> 37 nieces and nephews, uh, their mom maybe didn't know. And so now I'm going to pop up and destroy the fabric of the family. So finally, I, you know, after six months, I sent off my saliva to 23andMe, and that's how my siblings found me. I got an email. My wife came charging down the stairs, Mark, check your email. And I popped it open and it was this letter from one of my half sisters. And by the way, they've, they've since told me that they've banned the word half from their vocabulary, that we are brothers and sisters. There's no half about it. Uh, and so she said, we just want you to know we're open to meeting you. And I said, well, you may not know the whole story. Emailed her back, told her about the affair. 15 seconds later, phone rings and it's her. And we're talking and crying and sharing. And, and it just, it turned into this extraordinary odyssey of, you know, conversations and finding out that a bunch of my siblings and nephews and grandparent had essential tremor. So it's all over my dad's family. Uh, and so it was just, you know, and then I'm in an eight person chat with seven of all seven of my siblings at once. And they're all bombarding me with questions and little witticisms and clever remarks. And, you know, and so it, it was just joyous. And, and at one point, one of, one of them said, and I don't know who because they weren't in my context, one of them said, how is it possible for me to love somebody so much I've never met? So that should tell you the spirit with which this whole thing began. Uh, and so, so, you know, when I, so when I first got the news, it was actually kind of excruciating because I didn't know what to do with mm. that information, right? Yep. And so, but once they reached out and we realized that there was an actual connection that was going to be made, I don't know. There aren't many moments of my life where I felt that, you, you know, dumbstruck and euphoric. Uh, and, and I guess to me, you know, what I've, what I've found with my life, and I just, I have such overwhelming evidence on so many fronts with my family members, with students I've taught with in my own life, that, that this is true, that we, we create these self-fulfilling prophecies of what joy could be possible. And we stop trusting that there's beauty there, that there's love there, that there are human connections just waiting for us to show up and, and savor. And so this was, this was just another one of, and my wife, my wife can testify, a thousand of these moments where if I'd been guarded, stop trusting, you know, so, so that pain, I feel some of that pain is when we, we quit on ourselves, we quit on the world, we quit on the beauty that could be waiting for us on the other side. Um, and when we keep ourselves vulnerable and keep pushing forward and trust that beauty awaits, like I said, in my own life, my students' lives, so many people's lives, I've just seen so many beautiful things happen when they, when they didn't allow the buffets of the world to kind of harden them to love. That what you just tapped into, I think, is a really, really wonderful segue to the final question that I ask anyone who's here. And it taps into what you believe our optimal human nature is, if something like that exists. Mm. Feel free to completely 
answer the question in a different way than I'm asking it if you feel like none of the answers are relevant in whatever way you'd like to answer, but okay. it's a bit of a convoluted question. <laughs> is our optimal human nature found in values of the past, promises of the future, or is humanity a doomed enterprise? Mm. Mm. I, you know, somebody asked me, I was having lunch with a former student of mine in New York about six months ago, and we were talking about some of the hardships. And, and I think some people, when they hear me talk about, you know, my joy of life and all the, you know, the, this sort of optimistic viewpoint, they think that nothing bad's happened. Mm. You know, that I must have this rose-colored glass existence. Well, of course, you can afford to be optimistic because you've had this charmed life or mm. nothing wrong, you know. <laughs> I, I could give you the litany, but but here's the thing. So that's what, here's where, while I recognize the impact of the past, here's why I reject living in the past and allowing that to dictate the future. I could give you all the, the horrific things that have happened to me in my life, but every one of those horrific things helped forge me into the person I am, helped helped bring my spirit to a point where, where I'm now open to the things that happened to me, I wouldn't take back a single tragedy, a single uh, trauma. It, it all served as instruction. It all served as a crucible in which I was formed. And so, and, and in terms of humanity being doomed, not a chance. Not a chance. Even in the midst of all the turmoil that we see around us right now, I still believe in the core humanity of, of the world, of the people around us. Uh, and so to, to go back to the, what I was saying to that student, he said, you know, how do you keep this really optimistic viewpoint after some of the things you just, because he, he, we were talking about some of the traumas because he'd gone through some and, you know, so then I, I shared some of mine. And he said, you know, how do you keep that, you know? And I said, and, and this is how I live my life. I choose love. I choose love. And for every one time somebody has betrayed me or hurt me or I've put myself out on, on the line and, and had the branch, you know, somebody sawed it off behind me, I can give you more examples than I can count of times where that faith was rewarded and where I get, I got back so much more than I gave because I trusted that it was possible. And so I just, I continue to live my life with love and a, and a hope for the future and a belief in the inherent goodness of the human spirit. And I've just seen too much evidence to the contrary in every walk of humanity from, you know, every type of human you could ever walk across. I've seen it. And I just believe that that, that, that light exists in every person. And so I embrace that and I trust it and, and I look forward to what I hope are going to be another 30 or 40 years worth of getting to savor it. Mark, I'm so grateful for you inviting me into your mind. I believe I was invited into your heart and uh, I was invited into your driveway and I'm grateful for you being a reflection for me of what it, like, uh, what it is like to be in touch with and communicate emotion. Mm. Thank you. It's, it's a joy to have had this conversation. My memories of you as a student of mine are crystalline, and, and I have such, such happiness when I think back on the times we spent together and, and the fact that we've been able to reconnect now in the last four or five months. Uh, it just deepens my appreciation for the kind of human you are and the impact you've had in my life. And so my, my gratitude is offered up to you for everything you've brought into my world. And I look forward to our continued connection as the years go by. I'm so appreciative of your words and the gratitude is beyond reciprocated. Thank you. So, onwards. <laughs>